the first question I always get when we start a new class is, what do I need? Well, let's start out with a clean machine. Get out that lint brush and start cleaning out those nasty areas. Your machine will love you. But don't use canned air. Let me explain why. Look how clean this machine looks right now. But wait a minute, let's pull it back. That's what happens when you use canned air. It pushes it right into the insides of the machine. Having a tension headache? Let's take a look at setting machine tensions. In addition to having a clean machine, we want to preset the tension before we start. And you'll do that by using the same fabric and the same batting that you're going to use in the project. Let's do a test on the tension before we get started. Now I'm just using the regular machine foot right now for a tension test, but let's see what we have. Doesn't look too bad, although you can see some loops there. Let's turn it over on the back side. And you can really see the loops there. Now while you're busy sewing, your machine is playing tug-of-war between your bobbin and your top thread. In this particular case, it appears your bobbin thread is winning because it's stronger and it's pulling the top thread down to the bottom of the quilt. Let's address that before we go any further. So let's tighten up the thread tension on the top and see what we come up with. Now to tighten it on my machine, I have a dial and it has numbers on it. And again, the old adage, righty tidy. Now normally you don't have to turn it quite this much but I had exaggerated the turn to imitate the loose tension so that you could see what we were talking about. So let's go back down to the stitching and see if that fixed the problem. Now we have a more balanced stitch on the top and incidentally one of the reasons you don't want loose stitches like this from, from bad tension is because you can just pull those stitches right up when they're not balanced and you certainly don't want to be able to do that. So now that we've adjusted our tension, let's turn it over. And you can see that it's the same on the front as it is on the back. Nice and even, no loops. Now needless to say, if the bobbin thread was being pulled to the top, that would mean the opposite. That would mean that the upper thread is stronger, so therefore the tension on the top thread needs to be lessened so it doesn't pull the bobbin thread up. To loosen the top tension, turn your dial to the left. So in review, what we're looking for is a correct stitch where your upper and lower threads meet in the middle of your quilt sandwich. Now, depending on the type of machine you have, you're either going to have a dial tension adjustment, as shown in the top right photo, or you'll access your tension settings through your computerized display, as shown on the bottom right photo. 
If we go to this second scenario where your upper thread is too tight, you can see how it's pulling the bobbin thread up to the top. In this case, you want to lower the tension on your tension dial or on the screen. In the third scenario, you can see where the upper thread is too loose and it's being drawn down to the back of your quilt. When that happens, you need to increase your thread tension. One of the main differences between a domestic home machine and a sit-down quilting machine is the size of the bobbin. One is an L size, that's your domestic, and the sit-down quilter has an M size, which is larger. You also have a difference in adjusting tensions. I always start with the bobbin tension on my sit-down quilter, and I have yet to touch the bobbin on my domestic comb machine. Adjusting the tension on my quilting machine on the bobbin area is very easy. There are two screws. You want to use your small screwdriver and turn the larger adjusting screw. Again, the same theory holds true. Righty tighty, lefty loosey. Once I get my bobbin tension where it's supposed to be, then the upper tension is a cinch to set. I made a video a while back called Filler Up and Chuck the Oil. It will show you how to adjust your tension on your bobbin as well as other maintenance for your sit-down quilting machine. There is also a mechanical gauge for both the L and the M style bobbins to show you exactly how much tension is on that bobbin case. There are a couple other tension issues, or what people think are tension issues we should discuss. This is not a tension issue. This is having your thread come out of the tension disc or out of your take-up lever when you start to sew. Easily fixed. Simply re-thread your machine, making sure that your thread is caught tightly in your tension disc and it is in your take-up lever. Now this is something that everybody experiences. And it's called eyelashes, generally found on the back of your quilt and always found when you're doing curves or sharp points. It means you're moving your hands too fast for the speed of your machine. Again, this is easily fixed just slow your hand movements down, keep the speed of your machine where it was, and you'll be fine. In this slow motion video, you'll see how your threads interact with each other, both your upper thread, which is gold, and your bottom thread, which in this case is red. Take a look right here. That's the loop that's formed when it's stitching. And it continues to make those loops. And what you're trying to do is to make sure those loops are even on your quilt. One of the things that makes a difference is to make sure that you have a free motion quilting foot. Now I want you to watch this. It's going in slow motion. And you can see how that foot works with the needle bar. As the needle goes up, it pushes the foot up. Let's, we'll slow it down so you can see how that works. Now this is really an ingenious little foot with that spring bar. In order to form a perfect stitch, you do have to have something pushing down on your fabric to make the stitch. And when the foot comes down, and it's making the stitch, you can see the foot is exactly down on the fabric. But when you're ready to move it, the bar comes up, the needle bar hits the foot, and it forces the foot up. So it's allowing the foot to go up and down, up and down, to allow you to make 
free motion quilting stitches. Now this is something you very rarely see, but if you look at the throat plate on the machine that's on there right now, you'll see it has an elongated zigzag hole. If you change to a throat plate with a single hole for a needle, you'll find you get much nicer stitching and also fewer skipped stitches. Now, if you really want to get my dander up, let's talk about needles. We've had people tell us that they've had needles on their machine for a year. What? A needle is not meant to last as long as your sewing machine. A needle is lucky if it lasts the life of your project. They are inexpensive. If you buy them in bulk, they cost you about 25 cents a piece. Compare that to the cost of your fabric and batting and everything else. It's a cheap investment. But let me show you what that poor little needle has to do. Do you remember the loop that I showed you earlier in this video that was formed with your thread and bobbin threads? This is how this happens. See the gold thread? That's your top thread. And it wraps around the bobbin and connects with the bobbin thread. Let's watch that again. It gets caught up in a hook on your bobbin. It gets brought down below the surface and here it comes. Watch it. There it is. And it's coming back up to the top. And that is what forms that loop. Now let's watch it in motion. Now the bar that you're seeing up above the bobbin is actually the feed dogs moving. Right now I have them in the up position. And that's what happens when your feed dogs are up and you're stitching. Now let's examine the feed dogs. Here you can see that they are raised. Now the next sound you'll hear right there is the lowering of the feed dogs. And you saw how they did go down in the, the film. But you see how they're still going back and forth. Now that's because I still have my stitch length on 2.5. Now I've taken it to zero. And do you see the difference it makes? I often wonder why you were supposed to reduce the stitch length when you control it yourself when you're free motion quilting. That saves a little wear and tear on your machine. And now for the all important needle. The unsung hero, the one that does all the work that allows your machine to make all your stitches. Now we're going to talk about this lily needle. First we're going to dis discuss the butt of the needle. That's the very top part where it goes into the machine. And it's a certain shape just to make it easy to insert. Next comes the shank of the needle. This will be the thickest part of the needle and is sometimes flat on one side for home machines on industrial or sit-down commercial machines or home quilting machines. It's rounded. It also often has the marking as far as size and manufacturer. The blade is the warrior of your needle. It's the one that takes all the abuse and the friction but at the same time does all the protection because it has a long groove down the front of the blade in which your thread is wrapped inside of as it passes through the multiple layers of your quilt top and your batting and your backing. So that blade protects it and that groove leads right into the eye of the needle 
and at the very bottom is, of the blade is the tip. One of the reasons people have trouble with fraying thread or breaking thread is they're using the incorrect size needle for the thread that they're using. You want to make sure that your needle will accommodate the thickness of your thread so that it will be cradled in that groove. While the blade might be the warrior, the scarf of the needle is the hero. That's the part of the needle that allows all that you saw in the bobbin case area to work. That's the part that allows the loops to form, that allows your bobbin and top thread to form that loop. Without the scarf, the needle would just go in and out with nothing happening. Let's look at that a little bit closer. Have you ever thought to yourself, hmm, I wonder why there is that indentation on the back of my needle. Is that just to show me that's the back? Oh no, it does way more than that. So this is how our hero, the scarf, works. The needle penetrates down through the layers, and you can see how it, the thread is being hugged tight to the needle, both in the front, in that long groove, and in the back. Now, as the needle starts to go back up to the top, you can see how the pressure on the thread on the back between the top and the scarf of the needle starts to swoosh that thread just a little bit. Now, as the needle rises a little bit more, you can see that it forms a loop. That's the loop that the hook of the bobbin catches to make the lock stitch. Now we've covered a lot already in our first lesson and we haven't even got around to sewing yet. But I hope now you can understand how your machine works, how your tensions work, how hard your needle works, and how altogether this wondrous machine can do so many great things for you. It does it all by itself. All we need to do is apply it with a fresh needle once in a while, clean it out on occasion, like every time you use it. If it requires oiling, follow your owner's manual and just enjoy the process. And don't worry about what your stitches look like when you first start out. Those will improve. I'll see you in our next episode of More Free Motion Quilting. Until then, enjoy.